praise the Lord, beloved of the Most High God, in the mighty name of King Jesus. I want to talk to you today about why you should be encouraged when you're discouraged and when you're going through trials and tribulations in your life. Sometimes it can feel or be extremely difficult to see hmm. seems like sometimes to even see the light of day when Satan is bearing down on you and attacking you And you're seemingly surrounded by darkness. Yes, you are in a spiritual battle. When you feel like you're encompassed with darkness. You need to know. The battle bega began before you even recognize the darkness. And before the attack even manifested itself. Your adversary, Satan, had been laying back, waiting, seeking for when he could attack. And it's always with the intent to kill, steal, and destroy. And so if the enemy has crept in and you are facing the battle of your life, you need to understand and, and refocus on the fact that you are rooted in Christ. That he's got you no matter how dark it looks. And even though you may not have an answer for, for the attack at this moment, you have the power of prayer. You have the word of the living God. Which Jesus pointed out that man shall not live by bread alone. But by every word that proceeds forth from the mouth of God. And in his word we have the truth. And Jesus is the truth. And he will fight your battle for you. The battle is not yours. You just need to do your due diligence in prayer and, if necessary, fasting. Some of y'all, I don't know who this is for, may never have missed a meal in your life, but it won't kill you. Just do a little research. And when I say fasting, I'm not saying you have to set out on a 40-day fast. That's not for everybody to do. But you can fast from the last dinner you ate until lunch. Skip breakfast. And say, I'm going to take this time to fast and pray. Or you can say, I, I ate dinner at 6 p.m. yesterday. I'm not going to eat until after 6 today. I'm going to fast for a full day and pray to the Lord. There's all kinds of ways you can fast. All kinds of ways you can do it. You just decide for yourself what you're comfortable doing. Seek the Lord. Ask him. He'll tell you what he wants you to do. How he wants you to fast. Do a little research if you've never done fasting before. And see the enormous benefits that also will bless your physical body with healing and health. The Bible says your health will spring forth speedily. And Isaiah, the 58th chapter, said he'll make fat your bones and that it will break 
every yoke. So it's a good idea to look into fasting as one of the things that you can do in your spiritual warfare against the enemy. Most of you are probably familiar with the story of Esther in the Bible. It doesn't take very long to read through if you're not familiar, or maybe even if you are, you may need to do a little refresher and go back through and read the book of Esther and see how the Lord really isn't mentioned in that book. And yet, you can see the handiwork of God behind the scene and how he goes and delivers his people from someone who hated his people and had manipulated the then king at the time to issue a decree against the Hebrews to destroy him. And how Esther, and I didn't realize this until recently, because the church is very familiar, at least the circles that I came from, with fasting. And they mostly do water fasts. But did you know that, uh, you know, Muslims get credited for dry fasting, but in this Bible, that's the kind of fast that Moses did for 40 days and nights he didn't eat food or drink. That's a dry fast. That Esther, when she spoke to her uncle, and she told him once he came to her to plead that she, you know, do something to stop the massacre that was about to happen to her people. And she said to her uncle, you go back and tell the people to eat not food or drink. That's fast. Dry fast, y'all. For three days and three nights. And she said, I and my handmaidens will do the same. And she said, and then I'll go before the king, and if I perish, I perish. Because you couldn't, you know, the story, you couldn't go before the king unsummoned. It was against protocol. And, and, and if he didn't keep the person in the court that was charged with <laughs> pulling out the sword and slaying offenders, if he didn't raise his sepulchre and say it's okay, you were going to die. Well, I found out that one of the names for a dry fast is called the Hebrew fast. Interesting. Uh, I've tried it here over the last few months. I've done several much to some my surprise, I, when I discovered that that was the type of fasting that was done, all these years I've been a believer, I didn't know it was a dry fast. I don't know how I missed that. I didn't realize it didn't register. <laughs> and so uh, I started trying it. I started with, I said, well, I'll go half a day and see if I can make it. I made it, no problem. So I said, okay, I go full 24 hours and did that. No problem. And after doing several different one-day dry fasts, I started, well, I want to go further. And so my first attempt at doing a three-day, I actually went three and a half days. And I was pretty impressed with that. Never having done it before in my life as far as that long. And it was uh, actually a pleasurable experience. I found it to be more enjoyable than water fasting. For me, water fasting, and I've done numerous water fasts for many days, multiple days. Uh, 
the longest that I recall doing was back when I was a teenager for about 40 days. Uh, in recent history, 25. And it was, ooh, it was difficult. I'm telling you. It was hard. I won't go into all of the, the difficulty. I may do a, a video on fasting coming up, but I'm just briefly talking about it here because it's one of the tools that you can use in spiritual warfare against the enemy. We know Jesus fasted and prayed. The disciples fasted and prayed. The apostles fasted and prayed. And some of us need to incorporate that in our life. Again, I leave it between you and God to determine how to do it, how long to do it. If you're not familiar with it, research it and prove it to yourself how incredibly safe it actually is. Fasting is not starving. But I don't want to get too much further off topic. You know, when I was a little girl growing up, there was a song at the particular school I used to sing. Uh, well, we all used to sing when it was called. I actually don't even know if I have the title right. I just remember one line from the song in particular. And it was, I am my beloved's and he is mine. I think it was his banner over me as love was the title. The reason I'm talking about that is we need to understand that we belong to Christ. We belong to him and not only, that's critically important, but also that he belongs to us. You know, you see that scripture in the, in the Bible that all the lordship, damnation, heretics like to use about Lord, Lord. Right? But when you reference, if you see other glimpses of the same picture uh, where, take for example, the ten virgins, the parable of the ten virgins. Five were wise, they were born again. Five were foolish, they were religious, they were not born again. And you'll see where they knocked on the door, the five foolish virgins, after Jesus came and carried away the five wise virgins. And they're knocking on the door and he, he answers them, doesn't open the door for them. And he says, I, I don't know you. They don't belong to him. And this is what I keep trying to point out. That when concerning, for example, the rapture, which is a biblical doctrine, he owns us. And in the Gospel of John, the 14th chapter, when, when Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. The Bible says he, Jesus is coming as a thief in the night. The reason he is not a thief is a thief takes what does not belong to them. So he's coming in the manner of a thief, but he's not a thief. So he can only take what belongs to him. And if you ain't born again, you don't belong to him. And even though he'd like to take everyone and deliver them from the wrath that is to come. As the scripture said. He can't take you if you don't belong to him. 
So his ownership of us is critically important. When you belong to him by being born again, he has delivered you from the the wrath of of uh, hell. Most assuredly, the Bible says when you're born again, you've been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. That's why, especially if a person starts getting into the word, they grow in knowledge, they grow in grace. You stop looking for a whole lot down here. <laughs> you start looking for the day when you're going to be up there. And you're looking for that heavenly city and that heavenly kingdom and the heavenly country and most importantly that heavenly king and you start longing in your heart you say I don't want nothing they could say you know, I don't want nothing from down here they could say oh you could have the lottery you could win that today and live the rest of your life in luxury or you can go be with Jesus right now in glory. I'm going to say, give me Jesus. You can keep your lottery. Because having that lottery, even though you have a lot of money, will not keep you from the trials, the tribulations, the woes, the heartache, the pain. I want to be up there where he's going to wipe every tear from my eye. And it won't be any more suffering at all. I'd much rather be up there. They can have it. The only reason we're still here. Is to preach. The gospel and seek and save that which is lost. And to be ministers of righteousness. Upon this earth. So people can see. Our good works and glorify. The Father in heaven. And hopefully get born again. Because we're supposed to reflect Christ. His light is so bright. The darkness can't comprehend it. And the only way they even have a chance. Of comprehending God. Is if we reflect Christ. Don't believe me. Search the scriptures. You'll see that's true. First Corinthians seven twenty three. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Art thou being a servant, care not for it? But if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. Likewise, also, he that is called being free is Christ's servant. You are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. Brethren, let every man wherein he is called Therein abide with God. And we'll stop right there. I want to show that you belong to Jesus when you're born again. And he belongs to you. 1 Corinthians 6.20 For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. And in your spirit, that's your spirit, which are God's, G-O-D apostrophe S, meaning possessive. He owns you. You're his servant. You belong to him. He belongs to you. And there are the scriptures I can reference, just pointing out not Referencing the particular context, but just the ownership 
of God and our ownership of him that he belongs to us Luke 1 47 and my spirit had rejoiced in God my Savior my Savior first Timothy 2 3 for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior Titus 3 4 but after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared Okay, and in many other scriptures, the point is, I'm trying to show you that he belongs to us. Just like when you get married and you have children, people don't introduce their husband and their wives as this is a husband or a wife or this is a child or children. They, when they're yours, you say, this is my husband. This is my wife. These are my children. Ownership. And as much as this wicked bee system we find ourselves in tries to break up the family unit and that's the goal, the goal of the devil to destroy the family because that was created. It is an institution that was set in order by the creator which is the Lord Jesus Christ and so the enemy comes in and tries to destroy anything that resembles emulates propagates the kingdom and what he has set in order man and woman male and female the family, the devil despises, and so do his minions, whether they're dirt devils, meaning flesh devils, or spirit devils. They are working in, in league with him. They are emissaries. That means agents of Satan, and they come to kill, steal, and destroy. So when you see that, it is the enemy. Then you understand whose you belong to. You must understand that to be able to operate firm, firmly rooted in Christ with your feet firmly planted within him. To understand that you are his workmanship. And that you are going to be doing his will. And certainly one of the things that is a part of his will is for you to engage that old serpent, the wicked one, and make sure that he stays under your feet and that you rebuke, bind, and yes, even curse him in the name of Jesus and engage him in spiritual battle. But to do that, you need to know whose you are and who you are in Christ. That's why it's so critically important that a person understand that all of their sin has been paid for. Because when Jesus declared on the cross to tell us thy paid in full for your sin, all your sins were future. You didn't exist yet. And yet it is a declaration by God Almighty. That's Jesus. He is God manifest in the flesh. The Bible says so in numerous places. And he has declared all your sin is paid for. Therefore, you are in perfect position. You are in right standing with God. Positionally placed there by King Jesus. Immovable. The devil's trick is to get you not to see that. Not to understand that. Not to comprehend that. And most importantly, not to operate in that. Because when any believer 
picks up the authority that Christ placed there and begins to utilize it, a cold shiver goes up the devil's back and his minions back. Because they're like, no, not another one. Not another one. We can't get to sit and watch football all day long. With not another one that's actually going to engage in prayer and fasting and binding and loosening and cursing. Biblical cursing as when Jesus cursed the fig tree. As when Paul told, ooh, I'm forgetting the gentleman's name right now. You know, may your money perish with you. When he was trying to buy the Holy Spirit. That's right, Simon. And he said, may your money perish with you. That's not where he left it because Simon did that in, in ignorance from the position he was coming from. Having been essentially a witch. So he did that in ignorance, thinking he could purchase the Holy Spirit because, you know, that's that's the world he came from. Not understanding the things of God, the things of heaven are completely different and don't operate the way this world do. And the wickedness in it. Beloved, be encouraged because even though it may not feel like it, in your darkest hour, in your deepest despair, you still belong to Christ, and He still belongs to you. There's a gentleman that wrote a book about this experience. He called it a dark night. And basically, he's referencing where it's a dark night time in someone's life and how you may not hear even at that time the voice of God I'm going to tell you something if y'all experiencing that get into his word because that's where you're going to hear his voice if you can't hear him in prayer don't stop praying number one just keep praying and two get into the word so you will be placed in remembrance of the many promises he's already made. You know, God, while meditation is a good thing, he don't need to repeat himself when he's already declared certain things right here in his word. And all you need to do is reference his word. So when you're saying, well, God, I can't hear you. Why I can't hear you? Get into the book. Hear him through his book. That was so you wouldn't forget. But you see people in this in this book, like Joseph. Joseph was probably for for an Old Testament character. For me at least, uh I have great admiration for Joseph. Because anyone that was a one woman type of guy always gets mad props from me. Because the Hebrews had a habit after layman I was uh, believe it was layman that uh, began that practice of polygamy and anytime I see a one woman man in this book I always admire him <laughs> so that's a, that's a sermon topic for another day but uh, you see that with, with when he pushed Leah on Jacob. He wanted Rebecca and he's like, now nah, you gotta take my older daughter first. Right? Well Joseph was a type of Christ in the old covenant. Jesus wept. You remember when Joseph wept over what? When he saw his brothers again? Remember Jesus wept. There's a whole lot of parallels with Joseph and Jesus. And so he talks about how, you know, those many years that Joseph was in prison. 
that uh, <laughs> it wasn't fun. And it must have been, listen, they didn't even have the power of the Holy Spirit. They didn't have speaking in tongues. They didn't have the comforter like we do. And yet, they were still able to manage because of their faith. He never lost faith. But he did go through some serious trials. Anyway, let me see if I can find the title of that book if you want to check it out. I believe it's called The Dark Night of the Soul. The Dark Night of the Soul, and the author is Lauren, L-O-R-E-N, Sarah. And I remember catching that particular program uh, on the John Ankerberg show. And it was, it was very interesting because he talked about how there were periods during this dark night that he was going through that he couldn't hear the voice of God, and he felt so very alone. And, you know, if you're going through that, one of the things you need to remember is whose you belong to. That he is yours and you're his. And he, even though you may not feel his presence, he's there, he's yours. And you're his. And that he will get you through. Be blessed, beloved of the Most High God, in the mighty name of King Jesus. Amen.